Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. We appreciate all the views and listens you've been giving us. Please spread the word. Let your friends and family members know. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can leave a comment as well. If you're watching us, you know you can take us anywhere you want to go and listen to us on every major podcast platform that's out there. Spread the word about how much you're enjoying the Lunch Hour podcast. Uh, Very excited to bring our guest on. If you know anything about me, you know that uh, to me, uh, film is a very important medium, Uh, 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 you know, in terms of of storytelling and capturing the imagination. Uh, And joining me today, and I love I love a good documentary film, Uh, that kind of narrative storytelling about real stories about real people, uh, to me is so incredibly compelling. And joining me today is Maureen Tusty. She's an accomplished filmmaker known for her work as director, producer and writer. She's the co owner and primary creative director of Sky Films Inc a production company she runs with her husband and partner, James Tusty. Uh, She has directed and produced several notable documentaries. One of her most acclaimed works is The Singing Revolution, uh, which chronicles Estonia's nonviolent struggle for independence from Soviet occupation through the power of song. This film has been widely recognized for its uh, its compelling storytelling and historical significance. In addition to The Singing Revolution, Tusty has worked on other significant projects such as Trailblazers, The New Zealand Story, and Sweden, Lessons for America. These films further showcase her ability to tackle diverse and complex subjects, bringing them to life through her directorial vision. Uh, she, Her career, Maureen's career, is marked by her dedication to creating uh, impactful and thought-provoking documentaries. Her work not only entertains, but also educates and inspires audiences. Uh, and she's got a great film out now. Very excited to see it called She Rises Up. Uh, Maureen, welcome to the lunch hour. So glad you could join us. No, thank you, Andrew. That was quite a mouthful. Yes, well, films. you know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, they, they, they tend to, they tend to, well, anyway, they tend to read about, you know, some people who are at the end of their career, uh, as opposed to folks who are really at the apex or moving into the apex of their careers. Let's start here. Film, I talked about, you know, why film is important to me. Talk about why film is important to you. I So um, early on, I was very clear. I gravitated towards real stories of real people. And I, I worked uh, on some fictional projects, but they just didn't resonate for me. And I just love um, when it's the the hearing things firsthand from the people who are living it, whether that was doing corporate work, educational work, or now our focus for the past um, 12 years has been um, primarily 15 years now, documentaries. Um, and we do tend to uh, film overseas and bring kind of lesser known stories back to the U.S. to share here. So, so I just feel that people say it so much better in their own words and from in this film one of the things we're most excited about is that we don't have um, content experts we don't have a narrator it is just the women telling you about where they've come from what they're working on and we follow along as they're really trying to make change in their communities she rises up a story of three women in three different areas uh, engaging in entrepreneurship. You and I, when we talked a couple of weeks ago, I told the story about my own story about being in Morocco and having a conversation about small business and entrepreneurship with uh, with Moroccan governmental leaders who said, "Well, we don't have a we don't have an entrepreneurial class here. We need to really we really need to teach that." I'm like, "Wait a minute! I go out into the bazaars, into the souks, and I see entrepreneurs all the time." They didn't see it as entrepreneurship, but there's something inherent in in people uh, in terms of their entrepreneurial spirit. I think it goes along with with their sense of freedom. Talk about these women. Talk about that entrepreneurial spirit. Sure. I think, you know, one of the the underlying um, takeaways from the film is that innovators are everywhere. Entrepreneurs are everywhere. They are, no matter how poor the country is, that spirit's there, that is human nature. We want to trade, we want to make things happen, we want to take care of each other, and that happens through um, interaction. And so 
the the women in these films they're um very different motivations but they're using their businesses to create jobs and um some of them primarily for women because the obstacles that hold entrepreneurs back that make it so hard to actually run a business in some of these regions of the world then you have the cultural barriers or they're just exponentially harder for women to break out in those cultures. So here are three women who have done it and and they made the clear choice to stay in their country, even though some of them did have the opportunity to, to get away. Um, Magat, uh, her parents pulled her away from Senegal when she was a child. That was a huge impact for her. She's gone back to create a job there, not because it's an easy place, but she feels that's the only way we're going to really impact poverty in this country is with job creation. Right. And, and I, I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. So let's, let's talk about, well, let's talk about the women. How did you, how did you find them? How did you come to learn their stories? We, we did a lot of research. We, um, we talked to people on the ground in probably over a dozen different countries and we were exploring, you know, how to hone down this story. And it came up, we, we kind of knew, uh, what the, the think tanks, the nonprofits, the groups working there, the same messages kept coming up. It's jobs, lack of jobs. Um, it's not necessarily lack of education. It's people are graduating from school, they're getting out and there's no place to work there. That's why they get on a boat and take these risky chances of going across the sea or they, they join a caravan. It's, they're desperately seeking work to take right. care of their family. So people don't want to leave their homes. And we just kept hearing this again and again. So we wanted to talk about that and the barriers. You know, there are still one third of the countries in the world have some form of legal barrier for women participating. Wow. And it's often under the, the premise of protecting them. But it's mm -hmm. that limiting access to bank account. You can't work after 7 p.m. because it's dangerous. Well, a lot of women, they don't have childcare during the day. They have right. it in the evening. So it, it just restricts their ability to get out and, and do it for themselves. And then, or needing to co-sign with your husband if you want a loan. So, so a lot of places are slowly improving those. And then you have to kind of, it needs to sink into the fabric of the culture. But still one third of these countries have these laws and they tend to be the poorest countries in the world that still have these very oppressive restrictions um, for women. And then also that trickles out into the whole business environment and the sure. lack of freedom to innovate in these locations. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because uh, two of the books that changed my life, and I mean that in a very literal, literal sense, uh, the Mystery of Capital by Hernando de Soto and the uh, the the book Property and Freedom by Richard Pipes, you know they talk about the protection of private property rights and and being able to you know live you know, remember in, the, in, in America was originally before it was life liberty and the pursuit of happiness and our Declaration of Independence it was life liberty and the pursuit of property you know this idea of of pursuing happiness and pursuing property they're intertwined. And if you have systems that don't have a respect for the full franchise of participation in, in naturally endowed rights, uh, that has an impact. If you're if you're essentially setting it up so fifty percent or more of your population cannot cannot participate in the economy directly as innovators or entrepreneurs, that's that's a problem, isn't it? It is, and and property rights is a great example, and and Desoto's work has has focused on that, and you we even saw that in Peru. Um, so, I think part of what we you see how um, how much like someone like Magat struggles in Senegal with all of the excessive regulation, excessive controls on how she can hire and fire people, and then you get into Peru where um, the poverty level is not as extreme but as, as in Senegal, because I think one of the things to, to get across is that a few reforms really can have an impact. Sure. You know, you look at the, the corruption at the highest level and say, you know, how is this ever going to change? How are you, how are people ever going to trust to want to formalize their businesses or, or, you know, put the effort into what it takes to gain your property rights. And in Gladys's case, um, she they had a phase of reform a, a while back that now women can get loans on their own, 
Well, that change a few years later allows for Gladys to get the first time she's formalizing. She's run a mini market for years. She built it up. She comes from the most extreme poverty and uh, and a very challenging uh, family situation in the Andes Mountains. She made her way as a teenager to Peru. She built up this mini market from the from the ground up, completely on her own, because it was so important for her to have her own income and not be dependent on a man. She has a, a great husband, but he's much more cautious than she is, and mm. she wanted to expand. And so she went out and got the loan on her own. And it's all in her name and she's now expanding and we followed her through that process. So, and then the whole experience of formalizing her business, she's discovering, you know, I am actually contributing to my country, but very often you have people that are afraid to, because it feels like, well, there's so much corruption and I don't want to, you know, is it really going to be used properly? And there's a, a little bit of a fear and a hesitation to formalize your business, but just that simple reform that Gladys could get the business loan on her own. She has now expanded, and now she's looking at getting a third um, business, uh, even since the film completed. The second one's gone so well. Wow. She's paid off the loan early because she is the hardest working woman I've ever met. And wow. she uh, and she's now looking to get another one to open a third store. And she and her daughter are looking to be the first uh, Peruvian you know, mini market chain that's Peruvian owned. And that's wow. kind of one of their ambitions. Yeah. That's, that's, that's amazing. It's, it's almost as though, you know, self-ownership has these important ancillary effects, right? The idea that you can make for yourself, which, which fundamentally to me, right? This is what I love about, about the film. And the film, of course, once again, is She Rises Up. It's uh, been released uh, in certain theaters. It's going to make its way around the country. Um, is this issue of, so we talk about the American dream. And I always say that the American dream is the entrepreneur's dream, as you said. That's why people come here. But the fact that they can that they can make for themselves in Senegal or Peru or wherever, this is transformative globally, isn't it? It is. And I think, you know, it's people come here because of the the ease of starting a business there, yeah. you know, someone used the phrase, uh, they gave me this phrase, um, the presumption of liberty that we yes. have here, that we could just start a business. We can do that. So yes, certainly there are groups working on, you know, better regulations and some states may be better business environment right. than other states, you know, and that matters. You see the flow of businesses in and out of states. So it's, you know, there's, there's certainly regulations here that people can talk about, but it's nothing compared to what the poorest countries deal with the impressive environment that these entrepreneurs have to fight against. But if they could create an environment like we have here in the US, they would absolutely be living the Senegalese dream. They'd be living right. the Sri Lankan dream right there. Yeah, but it, it, it's it's there. It's also a you know a, a reverse cautionary tale, right? It's like if you go, it, it should be a cautionary tale. If you go down this road of heaping ever increasing amounts of regulation, you cannot be surprised when it has these economic impacts down the road. It, Wayne Cruz at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, who comes up fairly regularly, former guest on this, he's been a guest on this podcast. Wayne Cruz says you don't have to teach the grass how to grow; you just have to move the rocks off the lawn. And he's, he's absolutely right in that regard. You know, when it takes an entrepreneur in Washington, D.C., if a business idea takes them 14 months to go from concept to opening, that's a problem. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's much, much worse in a place like Sri Lanka or Senegal or Peru, but it should be a, these places should be cautionary tale. I'm sorry, they can be cautionary tales. They should also point the way for why you should go down the road of, of, opening things up and not burdening people down with red tape. I guess that's the point that I'm making here. No, it's, it, it is true. And it's, um, and I think people, it's easy in the U S to think, you know, Oh, but you have to have protections. You have to have regulations. Sure. It's like there are laws and you have to enforce proper laws, but that's not what we're talking about in these Absolutely. countries. It's so extreme. And even Magat's Wade from Senegal, she are, she says it so well in the film. Um, she talks about, this is not our heritage here in Africa. And she's a very huge proponent of like, we, it is, and she says, our birthright is to be free enterprise people. And yes. all of these regulations and the majority of the laws around the books are, are residual from when the French were there. 
and are still yes. influencing that whole um, nature of how business and the whole attitude towards business there. And she's like, that's not who we are. You know, Africans have always traded and these are her words, right. but, um, but it's just, it's, it's so for her, it's very much like getting back to what is our true culture. You know, it's interesting you say that because there is a, a lot of scholarly work on the vestiges of colonialism and how that impacts the sort of the post-colonial society, whether or not it's the labyrinthine, you know, Napoleonic codes that we still see down in, you know, Louisiana, or whether or not it's, you know, uh, the Spanish colonial corruption and how that blended into things. And uh, even to a, an extent, English colonialism down the road, though there was certainly more of a mercantilist class. I don't remember how Sri, who, who had, uh, was it the Portuguese that had uh, the, a colon? It, it, it was the, the last was British. Was okay. The final. Uh, yeah, of mean, course. Yeah. It's Ceylon. That's when it was, that's when it was Ceylon. Yeah. So, so, but that's, that's interesting to go down there because you're, you know, to, certainly the, the smaller libertarians of the world will tell you, and I, and I think there is some merit to this, that man's natural instinct is to want to trade with one another, to do, to engage in commerce with one another. I mean, that's so much of our evolution as, you know, civilizations over the years has been because of, of trade. This is, you know, these three stories seem to be emblematic of that. Absolutely. And um, I always get a little hesitant in these longer conversations because sure. I am not an economist myself. No, but no, no. I, and I think that's why we try to humanize this because, of it's, you know, we sit here and we talk about um, trade is our, our natural. Absolutely. It's like and it's also what allows communities to thrive, you know, even from the most basic time. I can grow this. You can grow that. Or I have this skill. You have that skill. It's it is human instinct for survival well, and for growth. Let's let's pull yeah, it back. Cause, cause you're right. I don't want I don't want you to <laughs> feel like you're you're <laughs> wading into waters that are out of your depth. But the point in all of this is, all of these films are about individual stories, and there are common threads that run through them. Whether or not it's the singing revolution in post Soviet Estonia, or whether or not it's what's going on in in New Zealand or or Sweden. I mean, talk about those common threads. You know, this is. I, I, in terms of your bio, it's the fourth film. I'm not sure if it's the fourth film that you've you've done. You've you've done other things, but what are the sort of the common themes that you've come out having made documentary films over over the last uh, several years? No, it's, it's funny. Since we um, uh, started Sky Films 15 years ago, we've done about eight different uh, documentaries, and uh, some of them theatrical or, or public television. But they we do have this theme of uh, human freedom. And whether yeah. that's whether it's through political freedom, economic freedom, personal freedom. So um, we but the we do have these themes of economic freedom and how do you humanize that? So yeah. it's we go out, we find people who are living it in regions of the world where it's really had an impact. And it is what has allowed a billion people to have come out of poverty since the 1990s. So in the past 25 years, you know, their progress has been made. And I think, though, in the headlines, there it's with all the crisis and climate change and all these other things are dominating it. The work's not done yet, and poverty is there. And so, so we're trying to bring the focus back to um, in particular women and what financial independence will mean for women, in particular in these regions. And until that is addressed, you aren't really going to have an end to poverty. And so that that intersection of entrepreneurship, you know, women's financial independence and the impact on poverty. And that's what we try to weave together through these women who are living it. So they are living it every day. They're, you know, every morning they're getting up and figuring out their businesses and rolling with the extreme political unrest that's happening in particular in Sri Lanka yeah. and, and Peru over the past year. And and yet they still are growing. And so it's possible. No, it, it, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, you you sorry, as I, as I sort of go to I got all kinds of questions in my head here. But, you know, you talk about the, the, the this issue of rising people out of poverty 
and how many people have been lifted out of poverty through this kind of entrepreneurialism. And, and you know, at the same time, you've got the folks who point to the, the, the downside of, of all of these things. And the reality is that we have to focus on what works. This is where I was going to go, because and, and I, understanding you're not an economist here, but there are two there are two approaches. Right. Um, um, long the, even in America, there have been two approaches to the entrepreneurial entrepreneurism entrepreneurship, thank you, to entrepreneurship. And one of them has to do with access to capital, right? The, the whole issue of microfinance and microlending. And the other side is the issue of, of the regulatory side of this. Now, if you're a woman in Sri Lanka or Peru or Senegal, and you can't sign a loan for yourself, well, even, even the microfinance side of it doesn't work uh, on all of these things. But I, 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 the, I guess the point that I'm making here is, it's a combination of the two in places like a Peru or Senegal or Sri Lanka, where you have to focus on both the regulatory side of it and the access to capital side. Yeah. And I think in Sri Lanka, so even some things that we, we talked to people about in film, but we couldn't quite get it all into the film. But uh, a good one, a good example is that uh, we do talk about um, period poverty, which mm. is uh, women who don't have access to menstrual products because they're too expensive. And so young girls who have to wear white school uniforms don't wow. go to school for risk of staining their uniforms. And so they're missing a week of school every wow. month. So when you hit that prime teenage age, when you need to be in school and that they're, they're just kind of, they fall out of school, they can't afford these products. And literally women are still washing rags because it's too expensive. So, so, Selena, through her company, Celine, during the pandemic, um, and so, okay, instead of these luxury textiles, we're going to do something practical. We have to keep our employees working. We have to find a product, but we also want to tackle another issue. So they started um, producing reusable pads. Wow. And now they are producing, and it, it skyrocketed. So they're trying to get now um, permission to be able to and get all the regulations for um, selling it internationally. But it is um, reusable pads that take away the burden of needing to buy menstrual products every month. But there's also this yeah. other amazing group, Advocata. They're tackling it from the regulatory side. They're saying there was a tariff of over 100% on menstrual products coming into Sri Lanka with the intent to supposedly protect the local producers, but there okay. are no local. And then, but what happened was the few local producers had a monopoly. So they yeah. were still super expensive. So this huge tariff, you know, no competition was coming in and menstrual, menstrual products are still on So Avocada started to bring awareness to the whole period poverty issue and the tariff issue. They got it reduced down to 50% and they are in process where I, don't know if it's happened yet, but they are almost uh, possibly getting the tariff eliminated wow. on menstrual products. So affordable products will come in. So it is, it's groups working on it from the regulatory side, but then also entrepreneurs using their businesses to solve right. solutions in their own community. Which is the essence of entrepreneurship is, is figuring out what the problem is in a particular society and finding a way to address that problem. That, that That's, you know, build a better mess trap. Ma Sorry, there you go. Want to make a pithy quote and I can't do it. Build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door, as, as they said. Um, let's talk about some of the other films. Um, I, I was a, a Russian studies major in college, uh, obviously, and then the Soviet Union disappeared in the middle of my junior year. Uh, so the, the former Soviet republics, especially the, the Baltic states, uh, hold a special interest to me. Tell us about the, the singing revolution and the story there. Sure. Now that one has a very special place in our heart. So um, my husband, Jim and I, so my husband's father is an Estonian immigrant, okay. but he, he doesn't speak Estonian. He didn't grow up knowing it. We had the opportunity to teach a filmmaking course in one of the first universities after Estonia regained its independence. Wow. And it was there that we started, people started telling us stories about what happened during this, you know, during the 50 years of Soviet occupation, but also about the singing revolution. And they would talk about what it meant for them to be at these festivals. So they would have a hundred thousand. It grew to wow. 500,000 people in this tiny country of 1.4 million. 
they would all come out to these massive song festival protests and singing wow. protests. And you see also how much uh, song was a way they maintained their culture throughout sure. the, this. And when they would have this festival every five years, the, the Soviets tried to co-opt that and certain Estonian songs were forbidden Sure. You could only sing these very pro songs, but then there would be these moments, even in the 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 sixties and then later in the eighties, where they would just spontaneously thirty thousand people on stage, a right. hundred thousand people in the audience, everyone is singing these traditional wow. songs, but they all know them. They all are singing in perfect harmony. So you know that these songs have been kept in the right. home as well as the culture has been kept in the home. And it was very strategic also. So along with these mass protests, taking advantage of Perestroika, they worked so smartly on how to push the limits, but keep it nonviolent so there was no excuse for a crackdown. And then right. ultimately, a lot of what they were doing really helped the kind of the final stages of the Soviet Union just crumbling. And um, and Estonia is one of the the strongest, most thriving countries in the EU today. It's it's amazing what they have achieved since then. Yeah, a little a little bit of freedom goes a very long way. And what I love about this because. I've been a, a, a student of protest music, you know, my entire life, basically. Um, and so I understand the, the power of song. And if, folks, if you know anything about the, the fall of, of the Soviet Union, obviously the, uh, the outer republics, not just Russia, you, you know, you know that, that, that Samizdat, which was the illegal and surreptitious copying of, of words, books, pamphlets, etc., and Magnetizdat, the sort of underground uh, replication of music for people to listen to, played a huge... I mean, music, again, it gets to what we're talking about here, uh, Maureen, which is the issue of of telling stories to people in simple ways, right? Documentary film tells a story of, you know, whatever the subject matter is you're talking about. Narrative film tells a story, uh, but songs as well, they 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 tell they can tell sometimes more complex than others but they can you know tell very simple messages that people understand don't they it is and you can't you know get into all too many facts and data and overwhelm people it's right. it humanizes the story suddenly you're seeing this person who's actually living the experience or or sharing what the experience was and and it just it allows you to absorb the me you know not even the message but it allows you to sure. absorb the experience and uh and so we work very hard to really have these be um just very personable but also very human very emotional stories because you are that's what film is you go to a film and that's why we we try to bring certain films to the theater so it's that experience you're sitting and you're absorbing it and you're feeling it and you're you're on the journey with these women and then it really all the underpinning is uh you know what's going on there just kind of sinks in so well what are uh sweden's lessons for america <laughs> so that that did come around where uh people may recall you know um uh Bernie Sanders even saying, you know, yeah. during the the election cycles we need to be more like Sweden. And uh and so we were approached to say, you know, well, let's really talk about Sweden. And there is a Swedish um uh e economist and economics writer, Joan Norberg, and so we partnered with him to really look at Sweden and he had been writing about it. And it's amazing because Sweden is, has a very unique early history. They, they did not have the same kind of uh, lord and manor surf mm. population. People were actually much more um, participatory in their government. So it allowed them to, to not have that same uh, extreme distinction. And then in, in the sixties, it did, um, they did cross over into that most extreme socialism of that yeah. we would describe today of, you know, a hundred percent income taxes, you know, ridiculous things, people, high profile people fleeing the country um, because it was, it was just out of control. And, and you, there was no business growing, but they very quickly, the one thing Sweden really does do is they pivot quickly. So yeah. within, you know, six, seven years, they realized, okay, this has gone way too far. 
business owners um, had a major protest and, and they kind of brought the voice of reason back in. And now Sweden today, they have, yes, they have um, very, very uh, extensive kind of social network programs, but they are incredibly free market. And they're yeah. one of the freest market countries that exists because you have to have that healthy, free business environment for innovators. So we went in and we followed some of these amazing innovators and a company that makes these amazing bicycle helmet alternatives. And, uh, and, and so it's just great to see the reason they are thriving is because they have such a healthy business environment and they were able to just see that and make the changes and actually act upon it. So, so it was, if that to me, the lesson is, you know, that, uh, um, don't think of those old days of the, the seventies of what we have sure. that residual impression of Sweden. If you look at what it is today, it's a thriving free market. Interesting. Um, and so, you know, yes, you're you're in the midst of promoting and importantly promoting She Rises Up. Um, do you know what you're doing next yet? Or you guys haven't figured out where you're just focusing on on She Rises Up for the time being? No, you know what? We are the worst. We should absolutely have the next project lined up. But, uh, but we are really focused on this kind of support for sure. She Rises Up. Talking to people um, after the theatrical, we'll be hitting all the universities. We've gotten tremendous response so far. This film will be seen on, on many universities across the, the country. Excellent. And then we'll continue on the, the distribution path. So it will eventually stream, you know, after we're done with all of that. So so we will, if you go to SheRisesUpFilm.com, we'll definitely be sharing what the next project is as it comes but really to get a documentary out these days the filmmaker yes. needs to be supporting the film throughout the whole distribution process right. and that's really our full-time job for the next three months so when you guys are not when you and your husband are not doing your documentary film work and it is it is a huge undertaking right you're talking about finding stories figuring out what stories you want finding the subjects filming them editing etc cetera, etc cetera. I'm sure you don't have a ton of free time, but when you do have free time, what are you, what are you guys up to? I, uh, we are, we're enjoying being home. That's good. <laughs> Not traveling and doing that. But uh, no, we, we both are very passionate about travel. And so, sure. you know, even going back to these locations when we're not working, because it's it's wonderful to work in other countries because you, you get to meet and interact with people in such a different way. But uh, but then we try to go back when we don't have so much work going on and then reconnect with people and, and be able to enjoy it. And uh, and then I do a lot of work with a, I'm a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. So when wow. I'm not traveling, taking injured and orphaned animals, it's very hands on, immediate in our own area which I feel like is a good, I need that contrast because working on documentaries and talking about these big issues, you know, it can feel overwhelming. Sure. Are we really having an impact? So I like having the uh, hands on as well. Any, any favorite airports, any particularly favorite meals in any of these countries <laughs> stand out in, in all of your travels? I, uh, I can, I can do um, Indian food or Sri Lankan or any Asian food every day of my life for the sure. rest of my life if I had to. So I just the food was great. It was it's good. And it's it's um but it's tough. It's tough when you're there with people and you have to, you know, just practicality, be cautious about right. what you're eating or sharing sure. a glass of water and it's and it's it's hard. So so the food is kind of not the the priority of uh of what we when no, no, and I understand working, that. I just, you know, you know I, but, but, but I, but I get, but especially when you're traveling on your own, you know, for, on your leisure time, it's just, it's one of those things where I'm sure, you know, that I get it. I did, uh, we did a week in, um, in uh, Algerian refugee camps, actually Southern refugee camps in Algeria for the Sarawi people. And I had a supply of, of peanut butter and, and other things that I, so, you know, I can keep my, my, my lower GI tract uh, uh, safe from harm. So I, <laughs> I, I, I get this. So uh, SheRisesUpFilm.com is the website coming soon to a theater or a university campus near you. Uh, Maureen, how do folks find out more about the good work you guys are doing? Uh, 
She Rises Up Film or skyfilmsinc.com is our company. Uh, but you can also, you can find the film on Facebook and social media where we're getting all that promotion going. But She Rises Up Film has a lot of information, not just about the film, but other other ways to help. So then, you know, we get asked very often, um, you know, so so what can we do from here? And right. And then that leads to great conversations around, you know, it's not about foreign aid, you know, which isn't even right. the intent really isn't to impact poverty and has been shown isn't impacting poverty. It's not about buy one, donate one, you know, and thankfully people are moving away from that because the whole concept of sending people stuff to help, it's important right. in a crisis, you know, in a, in a fire, in an earthquake, you know, to, for immediate help but it is not long-term solution. And think of all of the, uh, Senegal has tremendous leather industry and shoemakers. So sending yes. shoes doesn't really help them. Right. It's, it's hurting their business. So, so think of it in terms of who, what can you buy from Africa? What right. can you buy from a business person in, in Latin America? And then also um, the, there is a growing trend coming to um, supporting female entrepreneurs. And right. it's funny, there are all these studies out now that, in poor countries, when women may manage the finances, the communities are helped more. The families sure. are helped more. And they don't say, and they're like, well, we can't exactly say why and this and that. And there's more, you know, all these socio sociological studies, but it's like, okay, well, we kind of all know why, but it's yes. like, it really does matter for women to be controlling their own money does impact the community in a different way. So there's a lot being done. Even the UN women is focusing on microfinancing. They're focusing right. on um, care.org now has an enterprise, care enterprise or something like that. And they're focusing on financing women businesses in the most extreme poor areas. So they're pointing in the right direction. But then what's going to happen when you know, they try to grow their business or they try right. to hire employees and it's so difficult. So it's a great start to be pointed in the right direction and have this fo um, focus on women gaining financial independence, but it's not going to be the end. You have to then take it to the next step and look at that healthy business environment that allows real growth to happen. And real growth means ending poverty, real growth means, you know, people enjoying the prosperity that we have here and they don't have to leave their home right. to go find it. So, so really that's, it's great to see these trends pointing in a better direction, but you really got to get to that end point of it's these healthy business environments really need to be there to allow all of these entrepreneurs who are there already to thrive. When, when you're faced uh, with a policy choice between empowering people and disempowering people, empowering people to act on their own behalf is always better. Maureen Tusty, thank you so very much for joining us today. No, thank you, Andrew. This was great. Thanks for having me. So Maureen Tusty, she and her husband are the creators of She Rises Up, coming soon to a theater or college campus or computer <laughs> screen near you. Thank you all so very much for joining us on yet another episode of the Lunch Hour podcast. Remember, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, leave a comment. Let everybody you know know about the podcast. I'm Andrew Langer. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream 